Homage to the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. Today we're looking again at who are our role models and we're continuing with looking at Venerable Mahakachana. He was uh, honoured as the most accomplished of the bhikkhu disciples in being able to explain the Dhamma uh, where the Buddha had briefly stated it. And in the first part we had looked at his background and this included his previous lives and his last existence, giving a few stories as well as an introduction to some of his accomplishments and qualities. And in this second part that we're looking at, we're looking more at his teachings, some of which are where he had explained in detail what the Buddha had briefly stated. And in other cases, it was teaching or counsel that he gave lay people such as King Chanda Pajota and other uh, lay people such as Haladikani. And uh, think of it this way, that instead of being able to go touring around the world in terms of taking a tour, take this as a bit of a tour of Venerable Mahakachana's uh, teachings. And it will give us a, a way of entering some of the Buddha's teachings or expanding on some of the Buddha's teachings as well as an opportunity to see where we may like to go and delve deeper into some of these teachings. So think of it like a bit of a Dhamma tour of, of the teachings of Venerable Makachana. When we go through the Sutta Pitaka, we find teachings of Venerable Makachana in the middle length discourses. We also find them in the linked discourses and numerical discourses. And then we also find two post-canonical works being the Petakopadesa, the Pitaka Disclosure, and the Neti Pakarana, otherwise known as the Guide, which are attributed to Venerable Mahakachana through his lineage or uh, school of teaching. Now, some of these teachings that we find are actually invitations for Venerable Mahakachana to describe in detail what the Buddha has stated in brief. And so there's quite a few teachings overall and there were also teachings that uh, he had given as bespoke teachings to lay people or instructions to the monks to consider as reflections. So we're not going to go through all these teachings, but we're going to briefly look at some of them in order to get an idea about how Venerable Mahakachana had this ability to be the foremost at explaining in detail what the Buddha had stated in brief, and also to look at some of those other teachings which offer some encouragement, and support towards the Noble Eightfold Path. And also to actually glean a little bit more about this Venerable in terms of his good qualities and his areas or strengths in his practice. If you're familiar with Venerable Mahakachana's teachings, then you'll recognize them to be very thorough, very balanced, and he's very careful and cautious in the way that he explains the Buddha's words. And the content that he offers is actually quite substantial. So there's a lot of depth behind his explanations rather than something that's quite light. And so that these are things that you can take away and contemplate and investigate in further in meditation. He's also meticulous in his expression and his ideas and explanations are very well conceived. And so at the end of the day, what you receive from Venerable Mahakachana is a very well-rounded explanation to the Buddha's words in brief. And therefore you can see why the monks would have approached him in order to seek an explanation. Venerable Makachana was also not known for embellishing his explanations, so he didn't pepper them with similes and stories and parables. Instead, he was much more to the point. And what we can gather from that is that he was much more about the insight pathways. He was much more about these jnana pathas, these knowledge pathways, to help us to meditate in order to get out of samsara. And this is uh, particularly true when you come to his lineage of teachings, which are contained in the Petakopadesa and the Neti Pakarana. That's what you really find, straight to the point um, teachings that show you this, if you do this, and you do this, you get to this. And if you don't do this, and you don't do this, you get to this, which is very much in line with the Buddha's teachings. So we'll start by looking at the Madhupindika Sutta. And this is in the Middle Link Discourses, and it's Discourse number 18. And this is the Discourse on the Honey Ball. And this was through an interaction that the Buddha had with a layperson, a Sakyan named Dandapani. 
And at the end of the day, uh, he had pronounced to Dandapani this thing around quarreling and being free of craving. So uh, really around uh, not quarreling and not craving, not holding on to views. And so the monks had asked uh, the Buddha to explain what he had uh, told Dandapani. Uh, and the Buddha had said these words, uh, Bhikkhus, from whatever source of perceptions and concepts a person frequently f proliferates or obsesses over, if there is nothing to delight in, welcome and remain holding to, this is the end of the underlying tendencies to lust, to aversion, to views, to doubt, to conceit, to desire for coming to existence, to ignorance, to talking up, uh, to taking up rods and weapons of quarrels, arguments, disputes, accusations, divisiveness and false speech. Here these evil unwholesome states cease without remainder. So the Buddha then got up and, and left. So the monks were perplexed and wanted to know more about this teaching. And so they had made the request to Venerable Mahakachana to explain in more detail what the Buddha had actually meant. Now, if you're familiar with uh, the Buddha's teachings, then you know there is a bit of a connection here with the Samadhi Bhavana Sutta, particularly around where we go Abhinandati, Abhiwadati, Ajosaya Titati. So we take delight, we welcome and we remain holding. And in this instance, the Buddha is really talking about Papancha. So he was talking about how we conceptually proliferate or obsess over things, particularly things that we take delight in. And that is the source of these uh, perceptions, sanyas and concepts. And so his teaching is really around abandoning these types of things because what they lead to is all these underlying tendencies and all these things that lead to quarrels and disputes and divisiveness and of course false speech. To explain the Buddha's words, Venerable Mahakachana goes through what happens with sense consciousness. So he goes through the ear, eyes, nose, tongue, body and mind. But he begins with the eye and he says when you have the eye faculty and you have the object and you have the eye consciousness, Together they make a sense contact and what manifests from sense contact in this instance with the eye, then you uh, manifest feeling or experience Vedana. When you manifest that, that leads to manifesting perception or recognition, which is this Sanjanati. And when you manifest that, it results in thinking or recollection, which is this Vitakati. And then when that happens, um, that conditions or it manifests conceptual proliferation or papancha, sometimes also known as obsession. And so he goes through each of the sense faculties uh, in order to see how each of the sense consciousness arises. And of course, all of them lead to this uh, conceptual proliferation or conceptual obsession. Now we can all understand this part of the teaching because that's what happens. Whatever you make contact with and take delight in, welcome it, remain holding on to it, it goes through this inside pathway. And that's in the in the negative sense because when we start to proliferate on that, craving arises. When craving arises, then we misapprehend the wrong view. We start to take things as me and mine. We, we see value in them. And we develop some kind of conceit around uh, th these views. And it's really based around ignorance and delusion. Now, in the same way, what uh, Venerable Mahakachana does is he talks about the non-arising of these sense consciousness. And so in a similar way, he says, when you don't have an eye that uh, makes contact with an object and develops this sort of eye consciousness, and he goes through all six of the sense faculties, then when there's no sense contact, then there's no feeling or experience, then there won't be any perception or recognition uh, and labeling. And then you won't think or reflect on these things. And as a result, you won't conceptually pro proliferate or obsess over things. So it's a similar way of looking at this Nabi Nandati, Nabi Wadati, Najosaya Titati, but in much more of the mechanics of how it actually works. Because when you don't do these things, when you don't take delight, you don't welcome, you don't uh, remain holding, 
and you're not going through the eye, that means your security guard is in place uh, through the eye, ears, nose, tongue and body and then mind, then you won't go down this pathway that makes you conceptually proliferate and then want to come back for more. So it's a very uh, mechanical approach to the way that he's described it. And it draws on the way that the Buddha has taught this to us before. But uh, this is one method of looking at um, these inside pathways to actually see how we create it and see how we don't create it. And so the monks were very happy when uh, Venerable Mahakachana explained this because when you don't get into this wrong view, and you, when you don't remain holding on to it and crave for more, and you don't create this sense of me and mine out of it, then of course you're not going to get into disputes, you're not going to get into quarrels, you're not going to worry about these underlying tendencies being activated. And at that point you can start to uproot a lot of these things. So at the end of the um, teaching, uh, the Buddha praises Venerable Mahakachana when he was told about what he ex had explained to the monks and he uh, honored uh, Venerable Mahakachana by saying that he was very wise, had great wisdom and he and the Buddha himself would have e explained it uh, the same way as Venerable Mahakachana had. And at the end, uh, Venerable Ananda said, just as if a man exhausted by hunger and weakness came upon a honey ball, in the course of eating it he would find a sweet delectable flavor so too, Venerable Sir, any able bhikkhu in the course of scrutinizing with wisdom, the meaning of this discourse on the Dhamma would find satisfaction and confidence of mind. And this was the basis of the Buddha naming this sutta the Honeyball Discourse. Another teaching is the Mahakachana Badakaratta Sutta. And this is in the Majjhima Nikaya and it's discourse number 133. And this was particularly around a set of verses that the Buddha had uh, given or spoken and it had been circulating around the Sangha for a while. And there was one bhikkhu, bhikkhu Samidhi, who hadn't heard of the, the verses and uh, didn't understand what they meant. And so the Buddha, the verses that were uttered were, don't return to the past, don't long for the future. What's of the past has been eliminated, the future yet to be reached. States that are now arising are there to be clearly seen. What is unshakable and safe, that is to be known and fostered. Today effort towards what ought to be done. Who knows, death may come tomorrow, for there is no promise because of death and his great army. Thus one who dwells ardently, active by day and by night, who truly has one auspicious night, as the peaceful sage has told. So uh, these verses were known as one auspicious night or one excellent night. And then Mahagachana was approached by the monks to actually explain uh, some of this. So rather than going through uh, the whole meaning of this, I'll just quote from Bhikkhu Bodhi and his essay on Venerable Mahagachana. And what he says is, Venerable Mahakachana uh, explicates each of the lines of the exposition by way of the six sense bases. One revives the past when one recollects the eye and form seen in the past, dwelling upon them with desire and lust, so too with other five sense faculties and their objects. One builds up hope upon the future when one sets one's heart on experiencing the future sense objects one has not yet encountered. One does not bind himself to desire and lust to memories of past sensory experience and yearnings for future sensory experience is one who does not revive the past or build up hope upon the future. Similarly, one whose mind is shackled by lust to the present sense faculties and their objects is called one vanquished in regard to presently arisen states, while one whose mind is not bound to them by lust is called one invincible in regard to presently arisen states. So what we can glean from these explanations is the Buddha's way of encouraging for us not to dwell in the past, so not to recall or have desire and lust towards things that have already been uh, abandoned or eliminated. And with respect to the future, that they haven't ar arisen yet, so not to want to encounter them, not to have the sense faculties 
desiring and lusting after them. It's another way of saying na binandati, na biwatati, na josaya titati. So not taking delight, not welcoming, not holding on to things of the past or the future. And then when it comes to the the states that are arising in the now, then they're to be clearly seen. That one also applies this na binandati, na biwatati, na josaya titati. And what we really should uh, focus on rather than that is what is unshakable and safe. That is what we should be focusing on, which is really this form of such aditana. Again, this determination for truth. What doesn't uh, decline, what is not death bound, is of course nibbana. And so the encouragement in the remainder of the verses is really around making effort, staying wakeful, having in mind that death may come tomorrow, if not sooner. That if you are wakeful day and night, putting our efforts towards the task of seeing through ignorance and craving, then we are actually experiencing this blessing or this auspicious night as the Buddha has uh, declared. So it's actually a very beautiful teaching, one that I guess uh, we can look at in more detail at another point. But clearly there's something quite beautiful here and Venerable Mahakachana has expounded in a very detailed and well-rounded way. We also have the Udesa Vibhanga Sutta, which is in the Majjhima Nikaya as well, and it's uh, number 138. And in this particular sutta, the Buddha was going to give a brief statement or a summary, Udesa, as well as an exposition, the Vibhanga. But he ended up only giving the summary. So the summary was, a mendicant should examine in any such a way that their consciousness is neither scattered and diffused externally, nor stuck internally, and they are not anxious because of grasping. When this is the case and they are no longer anxious, there is for them no coming to be of the origin of suffering, of rebirth, old age, and death, and in the future. And... Because the Buddha had departed and Venerable Makachana was there, the monks actually asked him to expound on this brief statement. And he went into great detail about each of uh, the things around consciousness, particularly around being scattered and diffused externally, how not to get stuck internally, and then also not be anxious um, out of uh, grasping or clinging. Now, essentially... Again, Venerable Mahagachana went into the sense faculties that either through the eye, ear, nose, tongue, uh, body and mind, that if you follow any of the objects, that means you uh, take delight, welcome, remain holding, again you become shackled uh, to the gratification of that sign. And so he was explaining through each of the sense faculties how that came to be. Also, uh, from an internal perspective, that if you keep going internally through the mind, through uh, the signs of gratification, and you become fettered to them, then again, you, you're stuck internally. And so he was actually uh, explaining how the Buddha's recommendation was to uh, attain the four jhanas, so the four types of meditative absorptions. In that way, even if you... Um, become tied or shackled but it's to a superior kind of happiness a superior kind of joy or rapture and that's when you can then enter into equanimity through the fourth jhana and so in that way he was explaining that you wouldn't get stuck internally and then he went forward by saying if you cling to the five aggregates then that's where the anxiety the distress the concern comes because you're always clinging to something that is death bound that is sliding so even if you get temporary happiness from the five aggregates, you can't hold on to it. It's not lasting and therefore it's not worth taking as me and mine. And for that same reason, um, it is subject to dukkha. So essentially uh, the alternative that the, that Venerable Mahakachana is encouraging, similar to the Buddha, it's not to cling to the five aggregates because when you don't cling to them, then you won't experience the anxiety, the agitation and the concern when things start to change, when they transform from that which is pleasing. And so in that way, that's how um, Venerable Mahakachana was explaining agitation due to clinging and then not being agitated, not, and, and that's because of not clinging. So this was another 
way that uh, Venerable Mahakachana was asked to explain the Buddha's teaching in brief. And this sutta, it's worthwhile looking at in more, more depth because we've only briefly covered it, but there's much more detail to what Venerable Mahakachana has said. And if it interests you, then please do go look uh, at this particular discourse. Venerable Makachana gave three teachings in the link discourses or Sangyutta Nikaya. Three of the four were actually to householder Haladakani. And Haladakani was uh, a lay householder who asked certain questions, particularly around statements made by the Buddha. The first one was around questions of Magandhya, which is in the Sutta Nipata in the Atakavagga. And the second one was around uh, the questions of Saka, King of the Gods. And the fourth one was around elements. And uh, so those were the three by Haladikani. And the last one was uh, in relation to a Brahmin, Lohicha, who asked um, some questions after a quarrel or, or some annoyance that Venerable Mahakachana had with some young, young youths. So... We're not going to go through every single teaching in the Sangyutta Nikaya of Venerable Mahakachana, but I thought we'd look at uh, the first one, which was around this verse from the questions of Magandhya that uh, Householder Haladikani had asked. What you can glean from the suttas, particularly around Haladikani, was that he wasn't any ordinary householder. He was someone that was very keen on the Dhamma, and he was very keen on the Buddha's words and wanting to understand them and also to practice them. And so he was very wise in going to Venerable Mahakachana. So the Pali verse that he asked about was something that the Buddha had, had stated, and it was, Okang Pahaya Anaketasari, Game Akupang Muni Satavani, Kame Hirito Apurakarano, Katang Na Vigaya Janena Kahirati. So in English, that's translated as having left home to roam without abode. In the village, the sage is intimate with none. Rid of sensual pleasures, without expectations, he would not engage people in dispute. So when you read this, um, particularly this sutta, uh, Venerable Makachana demonstrates his substance in this teaching, particularly because the teaching is broken into three sections. So you get the Udesa, uh, Udesa, Nidesa, Pati Nidesa. So the Udesa is like the summary um, or the, the brief explanation. The Nidesa is a slightly longer exposition. And then the uh, Pati Nidesa is when he goes into much more detail. And what they say about the Udesa, Nidesa, Pati Nidesa is that the first one is for people who can understand Dhamma very well. Their faculties are sharp. The second one, in terms of Nidesa, is for one whose faculties are slightly less blunt. And then the Panti Nidesa is more of a detailed explanation. It's for those who have more, I guess, what you call blunt faculties, spiritual faculties. And so it takes a little bit more for someone to understand the Dhamma. And you can see the compassion of uh, Venerable Makachana in taking the time to actually explain in these three ways, which makes you give an idea that maybe not just Haladikani, even though he asked the question, maybe there were other beings, uh, human and otherwise, that were there to hear the teaching. And uh, the one that I'll go through is the Patinidesa, uh, because this is really around um, something that lay householders can really uh, look into and we won't go into too much detail but we'll go briefly even though it's Patini Desa and so there were four aspects to this that the, the Buddha was talking about so I'm going to leave the first statement about having left home to roam without an abode because uh, there's more to say there but I wanted to talk about in the village the sage is intimate with none Rid of sensual pleasures, so that's the second thing, without expectations, and the fourth one being not engaging with people in dispute. So the first is about intimacy in the village, that the Buddha has said that um, the sage, the one who is walking the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, is not intimate in the village. And really, he's talking about the one that has finished it, but from our perspective, we're looking at it as one that's walking, it, walking the path and wanting to go in the direction of the sage. And so the words in uh, Venerable Mahakachana's uh, 
exposition is actually quite important because let me pull the sutta. Bear with me one second. Right, I'm back again. Just had to go get the sutta. Okay, so uh, Venerable Markachana says, and how a householder is one intimate in the village. Here, householder, someone lives in association with lay people. He rejoices with them and sorrows with them. He's happy when they are happy and sad when they are sad. And he involves himself in their affairs and duties. It is in such a way that one is intimate in the village. Then he goes on to say, and how a householder is one intimate with none in the village. Here, householder... One does not live in association with lay people, does not rejoice with them or sorrow with them. He is not happy when they are happy and sad when they are sad. He does not involve himself in affairs and duties. It is in such a way that one is intimate with none in the village. Now this first one is clearly uh, talking about uh, someone who is ordained because that's how you don't live in association with lay people. But I think that there is much to be learned from this, these statements because even though one can be a householder it's important to understand that we can still train to be not intimate in the village so we take um, Venerable Mahakachana's words that we don't rejoice and sorrow um, and we don't, we're not happy and when they're happy we're not sad when they're sad we don't involve in affairs and duties now, we all have uh, duties and responsibilities, so some of these things we can't actually abandon. But when you take on board Haladikani, you realize that there is a boundary that one can set in terms of being intimate in the village. To not be so nosy, to not be so concerned, to not want to be included in everything. And I think as lay people, when we're on the spiritual path, that's something that we can do. So we can't abandon all our duties and responsibilities, our loved ones, our friends, our colleagues, our people in our community. But what we can do is set some boundaries around how we deal with them so that we don't fall into ways that create more dukkha for ourselves and likewise don't create more dukkha for our family and friends and colleagues and other acquaintances. So there's something to be looked at in terms of this intimacy with the village. And I think this lends itself also to practicing with metta, that when you're not hankering for attachment to families or groups or people in the village, as uh, Venerable Markachana is alluding to here, then one can have more metta because you understand the predicament that we're all subject to be separated from our loved ones, for, from things that we, we love and that we find dear and pleasing. So why create more circumstances for being uh, clinging and intimate with things that we are eventually going to be separated from? And so healthy boundaries is probably something that we can take away from this particular teaching of Venerable Makachana. Now, varying degrees to, to, to how one can do that. Each individual circumstances are different, but clearly something that we can look at and investigate for ourselves. Now, the second part to the teaching is, and how householder is one not rid of sensual pleasures. Here, householder, someone is not devoid of lust, desire, affection, thirst, passion, and craving in regard to sensual pleasures. It is in such a way that one is not rid of sensual pleasures. And how householder is one rid of sensual pleasures. Here, householder, someone is devoid of lust, desire, affection, thirst, passion, and craving in regard to sensual pleasures. It is in such a way that one is rid of sensual pleasures. So clearly here, Venerable Makachana is warning, again similar to the Buddha, that it's dangerous to lust, you know, to have this lust, desire, affection, thirst, and passion. I mean, he's using all the similes around where we don't guard our senses against sensual pleasures. And what he's encouraging is to be very cautious, to have the security guard in place and to not take things lightly when it comes to sensual pleasures. So this, this includes our loved ones, this includes material objects and things that we gravitate towards and proliferate towards. And so his encouragement is quite strong. Now, there is an inside pathway here in the four things that we're talking about because if you're intimate in the village then you're not going to be rid of sensual pleasures because whatever you're intimate towards whatever you take delight in 
then you're going to not see as dangerous. You're going to have lust, affection, passion towards, and then it leads to tanha, this craving. So there's going to be some kind of abhinandati, taking delight, abhiwadati, uh, welcoming, and ajosayatitati, holding on to. And so you really begin to see the insight pathway in the unwholesome way starting to formulate. And so one needs to be careful. Instead, Venuva Mahakachana is, is saying the Buddha is encouraging if we are not intimate in the village, then we're not at risk of taking delight, having passion towards, holding on to, um, having thirst and affection towards things that we like or even dislike. And in that way, he's saying go towards the wholesome path. Now, the third part is entertaining expectations. And so he asks, how householder does one entertain expectations? Here, householder, someone thinks, may I have such form in the future? May I have such feeling in the future? May I have such perception in the future? May I have such volitional formations in the future? May I have such consciousness in the future? It is in such a way that one entertains expectations. And how household is one without expectations? Here, household is someone does not think. May I have all those types of um, form, feeling, perception, volitional formations and consciousness in the future. So clearly, uh, if you follow the inside pathway, when you're intimate in the village and you're leaning towards wanting sensual pleasures, then you're going to have expectations. And that is the unwholesome path. And so he's saying, Buddha's encouraging not to do that. And on the wholesome path, if you're not intimate in the village, if you're uh, seeing the danger of sensual pleasures through what you like and dislike, then you're not going to have expectations. You're not cultivating expectations through the five aggregates to actually create this tanha, this craving. And so then the fourth part to his teaching is really around um, not engaging in dispute. And so he starts off by saying, how householder does one engage in dispute? Here, householder, someone engages in talk such as this. You don't understand this thing, this Dhamma and discipline. I understand this Dhamma and discipline. What you understand this Dhamma and discipline, uh, you're practicing wrongly. I'm practicing rightly. What should have been said before, you said after. What should have been said after, you said before. I'm consistent, you're inconsistent. What took you so long to think out um, has been overturned. Your thesis has been refuted. Go off to rescue your thesis, for you've been defeated. Or disentangle yourself if you can, in such a way one engages people in dispute. And so how, householder, does one not engage people in dispute? And so you don't engage in the way that he's described. Now, this is the last part to the inside pathway. So on the unwholesome side, if you're intimate in the village, then you're going towards central pleasures. When you go towards central pleasures, you have expectations. And then that what that is what leads us into dispute. We argue over these central pleasures. We argue over our views around central pleasures and our expectations and when they're not met. And there's this one upmanship that comes through these disputes where we say, I'm right and you're wrong. Now, when you're not intimate in the village, so you're not making any contact in that way, you, you, you stay with right view rather than wrong view, then you're not um, endangering yourself around, around sensual pleasures, around views and opinions, around expectations. And so you don't engage in dispute. You don't put yourself in that position. And so in that way, you lead the, the wholesome path. And there's much to be gleaned, to be understood from this teaching, not just for monastics, but for lay people. Remember, he's talking to Haladakani, who's a householder, and he's encouraging. And we can clearly look at this sutta in much more detail, much more depth. And I think we'll do that at some point in the future. But for this brief glance at the teaching, you can already see that there's much that we can save ourselves from by following these steps, by understanding these Buddha's words. And uh, you can see the depth of Venerable Mahakachana's understanding, the way he expounds the Dhamma. And it's uh, very joyful uh, to see it so explicitly expounded. So we'll continue with our tour of Venerable Mahakachana's teachings, 
by looking into the Anguttara Nikaya now, which is the numerical discourses. And the examples that we're going to look at in the first instance is this Kali Sutta, which is in the 10th chapter, and it's discourse number 26. Now, the Buddha had actually uh, spoken about uh, the daughter of Mara, known as Tanha, craving. And I believe this is from the Sangyutta Nikaya, chapter 4, discourse number 25, and it's referred to as the maiden's questions. So in this instance, uh, a lay disciple, a woman called Kali, came to Venerable Makachana and asked him to explain in detail this verse from the maiden's questions. And the verse goes, Having conquered the army of the pleasant and agreeable, meditating alone, I discovered bliss. The attainment of the goal, the peace of the heart, therefore I do not make friends with people, nor does intimacy with anyone flourish with me. And this was the Buddha's answer to Tanha, the daughter of Mara, craving, when she had asked him why, instead of forming intimate relationships in the village, why he squandered his time meditating. And so he, he gave this verse. Now what's interesting about this teaching is we get to see the substance and the breadth of Venerable Mahakachana's uh, teaching ability. Because when you uh, go through this statement, it seems quite explicit. The Buddha is saying that he understood, you know, what is pleasant and agreeable, what is dear and pleasing. So Pia um, and Manapa. And so he was saying he's overcome that knowing that there's dukkha, when you get separated from what is pleasing and disagreeable, inherently you uh, always meet dukkha. And so he's conquered that army that comes with the pleasant and agreeable. And so instead, that's why he's meditating alone, because he discovered something that's more secure, more lasting. And so he attained that goal, which was Nibbana. And so for that reason, he says he doesn't make friends with people and he's not intimate, which is very similar to this Haledekani Sutta that we just went through, because what he's really saying, or what one could be interpreted from what he's saying, one of the things is that when you're intimate and you make friends, you form attachments. And when you do so, when uh, it changes, when uh, death comes, or when some sort of unhappy circumstance comes, because it's not lasting, then you meet dukkha. You know, the causes and conditions will always have you meet dukkha, meet the, the painful, meet the um, some kind of pain. And so in this instance, that's what seems quite explicit in what Buddha has said. But when Venwal Makachana um, goes to explain this, he actually talks it, about it in a different way. He actually starts to look at the seclusion of meditation above the pleasures of um, sensual and social contact, contact. So that's one of the, the meanings. But then he doesn't just give that, he gives the difference between the advanced stages of meditation. And that's why this is really about 10 universal dim dimensions of meditation, because when you're kind of uh, uh, what, what could be termed an ordinary recluse or an ordinary Brahmin, then you really go towards jhanas anyway and other kinds of states of consciousness. And such meditations are like the Kasina meditations, which is what um, Venerable Mahakachana talks about. But then there's all sorts of other contemplative meditation states as well. And so he's actually um, indicating in his teaching to this lay woman, Kali, that it's important not to fall into the trap of craving um, for these meditative states and particularly the refined meditative states because what it does is it creates this wanting to become, wanting to come into existence again for that kind of happiness, for that kind of bliss. But the caution is that it's not long lasting. It's not like Nibbana. So you may get some kind of bliss or serenity from the jhanas or from these other conditioned states, but the point is that they're still constructed, they're still conditioned, and they're still transient. And so when you can't relinquish them at the point of death, then that's going to become your reason for wanting to come back into another birth. And so you don't want to be caught in that particular net. And so it becomes quite an important teaching to understand these different kinds of meditative absorptions and to understand what uh, Venerable Mahakachana is warning against, that this is with, still within Mara's domain and 
if you find it agreeable and pleasant, then you know what he's actually highlighting is that's still the origin of suffering. That if you crave something like that, that's still going to be um, the second noble truth, the origin of suffering for you. If you can't see through it, then you can't see the the danger, which is known as adinava in Pali. And so you don't see it as impermanent. You you get stuck there thinking that it's lasting, and you don't see that there's dukkha in striving to stay up there. And you can't see that it's subject to change. And so what you miss is you miss the escape, the nisarana in Pali is what it's called. So you miss that actually there is this thing called Nibbana that the Buddha has spoken about and that he has obtained uh, jnana vimukti, so the, the knowledge and liberation of the true path. And this true path is the Noble Eightfold Path. And so the encouragement by Venerable Mahakachana is actually to look more deeply into what you're meditating on, what your meditation object is, what's the fruit of that meditation, and to make sure that one has right view, that you do see the, the Adi, which is the, the origin of it. You see the Adinava, which is the danger, and then you see the Nisarana. Is there an escape from it? Because if you don't, then you'll be still caught in Sangsara. So this is a very important teaching and it really demonstrates the depth and breadth and uh, profundity of what Venerable Mahakachana is able to even explain to a lay disciple. Venerable Mahakachana seems to actually be quite uh, skilled and knowledgeable around quarrels and disputes, um, things of that nature. And so people would come and ask him about it. And this was one particular instance. And this appears in the Numerical Discourses, chapter two, number two, uh, number 37. And in this instance, there was a Brahmin called Aramadanda and came to ask him the reason why aristocrats fight with aristocrats, Brahmins fight with Brahmins, householders fight with householders, and then also why ascetics fight with ascetics. And the answers that Venerable Mahakachana give are, in the first instance, when it comes to aristocrats, Brahmins and householders, he says it's because of their insistence on sensual desire, their shackles, avarice and attachment, that aristocrats fight with aristocrats, Brahmins fight with Brahmins and householders fight with householders. And then uh, the question about why ascetics fight with ascetics, and his answer goes, it is because of their insistence on views, their shackles, avarice and attachment that ascetics fight with ascetics. I mean, basically, this comes down to craving for sensual desire and craving for views. So it's quite a profound um, statement when you start to really examine it, because when you look at the classification of uh, aristocrats with uh, uh, aristocrats, that's probably like royalty, people with power, those that are uh, superior in their birth in Sansara. And also you have uh, Brahmins with Brahmins, so people who are knowledgeable. And then you have householders, uh, everyday lay people. And really, when you think about attachment to sensual desires, this could be people, this could be material objects, wealth, all those kinds of things that makes one quite stingy and also very attached. And when this happens, that's what uh, the disputes come from. And if you remember the Haladikani Sutta, he offered a lot more there because he was saying, when you're intimate in the village, then you find it difficult to be rid of sensual pleasures. You keep going towards agreeable objects and things that you like and find pleasing. As a result of that, you have expectations, you make plans around these things. And then lastly, you get in dis disputes around them as well. And so the answer in this instance is of a similar thing without all the ins and outs and the mechanics of it. And then when it comes to ascetics, uh, his emphasis is on views, that one's attachment towards views, being fettered to views. And we can really see that, that even for lay people, even for the, the, the aristocrats and Brahmins, once you overcome sensual desire, you're left with views that even when you walk the Dhamma path, what you find is that we're also bogged down, caught up in Dhamma views. That's where we get into dispute, where we quarrel with people. We quarrel with people, not just, not just on knowledge and science of the world, but we quarrel about Dhamma, the finer points of Dhamma and all those kinds of things. And that comes down to our insistence about views. And so 
particularly when it's around wrong view, <laughs> then uh, that's where uh, these difficulties, these arguments, quarrels tend to arise. And uh, when we know this, then we know that we want to abandon sensual desire. We want to have a very good security guard in place when it comes to our sense faculties. And then when it comes to views and opinions, it's really to correct our view so we don't get caught up in these things. And I think this is where the Haladekani Sutta that we went through, 22.3, really comes in handy to actually start to look more deeply into how we get into quarrels and disputes. But again, this is a shorter teaching and it's given to a Brahmin named Aramadanda. Now, this next teaching is also in the Ankutra Nikaya and it's in uh, chapter 2 and it's number 38. And this was one of the instances where Venerable Markachana didn't actually uh, teach uh, a detailed explanation out of a brief statement of the Buddha. Instead, there was this Brahmin called Kandarayana and he was reproaching, like telling off Venerable Mahakachana for not showing proper respect towards aged Brahmins. And uh, in response, Venerable Mahakachana said this, There is the stage of an elder and the stage of youth as explained by the Blessed One who knows and sees, the Perfected One, the fully awakened Buddha. If an elder, though 80, 90 or 100 years old, still dwells in the midst of sensual pleasures, enjoying them, consumed by thoughts of them, burning with fever for them, and eagerly seeking more, they are reckoned as a child, not a senior. However, if a youth, young, black-haired, blessed with youth in the prime of their life, does not dwell in the midst of sensual pleasures, enjoying them, consumed by thoughts of them, burning with fever for them, and eagerly see seeking more, they are reckoned as astute, a senior. And this teaching is actually quite beautiful because um, Venerable Makachana is putting this Brahman in his place because really uh, the truth rings out here that someone who is still imbued with sensual pleasures, no matter whether they hold a high position within the Sangha and they're aged and aged in years, uh, this uh, doesn't mean that they have seniority in terms of the Buddha's teachings. In fact, they're actually called a youth or a child because they haven't seen through the truth um, of greed, hatred and delusion. Whereas if someone is young, and, and that means young in age, young in seniority in terms of um, other things, other roles and responsibilities, but they don't take delight that they've seen through sensual pleasures. They don't uh, linger over them. They don't enjoy them. They're not proliferating over them. And, and they're definitely not burning with lust for them. Then they're actually termed senior in the Buddha's uh, teachings. And in this way, it's the same thing that we can use this kind of yardstick as people on the Noble Eightfold Path. You know, when you think about role models, this is one of the examples that the that Venerable Mahakachana is reminding us. A role model is not necessarily someone that in a samsaric sense has power, has seniority, has fame, has popularity. Uh, the role model is one who really sees through the dangers in samsara, sees through sensual pleasures, sees through greed, hatred and delusion. And, and those that actually maybe haven't even attained arahantship, but those that are practicing well, whether they're lay people or monastics, those who have actually even entered the stream and, and developed path and fruit, then they are the ones who are our role models, who we should be giving due respect to, even if they're not old, even if they don't have power and position but they have the Dhamma, they have the truth, they have the knowledge. So the last teaching of Venerable Mahakachana we're going to look at from the Anguttara Nikaya is the Mahakachana Sutta, which is in Chapter 6, Discourse Number 26, and it's about six recollections that the Buddha has taught. And one can see that uh, Venerable Mahakachana takes much joy from um, recollecting and uh, encouraging the monks towards the Buddha's teachings. And he basically says to the monks in this sutta, it's astounding and amazing, friends, that the Blessed One, the Arahant, the perfectly enlightened one, who knows and sees, has discovered the opening in the midst of confinement for the purification of beings. 
for the overcoming of sorrow and lamentation, for the passing away of pain and de dejection, for the achievement of the method for the realization of Nibbana, that is the six subjects of recollection. So what are these six? So the first three we're familiar with, which is um, Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. So one recollects the qualities of the Buddha, the qualities of the Dhamma, the qualities of the Sangha. And then the last three about uh, one's own uh, sila. So one reflects about the goodness of how one practices in the world, that it's pure, unblemished um, and wise, and it leads to concentration. And then one also reflects on uh, one's own generosity, that uh, one has good fortune to actually overcome stinginess and a sense of self by uh, one's generosity. And then the last one is around deities, around uh, the good rebirth, their good conduct and, and things of that nature as well, that they would have been quite generous and, and uh, the types of qualities that one would look up to. So in this way, you know, when you think about it, um, this reflection uh, from Venerable Makachana of the Buddha's uh, uh, teaching on these recollections is really quite wonderful because it puts the mind in a very wholesome place. And not only that, it actually gets us to look at other things or other beings who are, who are also worthy of respect and, and worthy of being role models to us as well. And uh, if we practice this, uh, what Venerable Mahakachana says is that we overcome greed, hatred and delusion. And by overcoming greed, uh, in, te in terms of the concentration that comes from this meditation, if we go sequentially through the six, then Venerable Mahakachana says that the mind dwells in space, infinite space. And so the mind gets quite expansive, which one can expect. And then he goes on to say that if you practice this further, then one can realize the, the truth, which is the purity um, that will get us through sorrow and lamentation, that will end all the whole mass of suffering and, and the sadness that comes with that, and also to end uh, the cycle of rebirths and to realize Nibbana. So it's quite an uplifting teaching or reminder from Venerable Mahakachana. It wasn't just uh, Venerable Mahakachana's teaching ability that the Buddha praised. We have this one instance in the Udana, which is the inspired verses of the Buddha. And it's 7.8 is the verse. And basically the Buddha was uh, sitting at his cottage in Jeta's Grove in Savati. And he saw Venerable Mahakachana sitting cross-legged, holding his body erect and having mindfulness re with regard to his body. And it was well established. And so he was inspired to actually utter this verse. For he who will be always and continually attending to mindfulness established on the body, thinking there might not be and there might not be for me, there will not be and there will not be for me. He who dwells in these gradual stages in that place can surely at the right time cross over clinging. And it's one of those things that it's really important for us to take heed from any of the noble disciples. And in this instance, Venerable Mahakachana, that he was already an Arahant, but he still practiced. He still abided in the, the places that Buddha said were for the happier mind, not to get caught in the dangers of sensual pleasures. So even as an Arahant, one wouldn't, um, one would have the security guard in place, you know, to have sense restraint. And for us as lay people, or anyone that is practicing the Noble Path as a trainee of the Buddha, that we should take heed that it's important to make time, to make time not to just practice eyes open, but to also make time for practicing eyes closed, to attend to the foundations of mindfulness, to attend to the meditative absorptions, to actually make sure that we are uh, uh, extracting and using the insight pathways of the Buddha and to take heed to the teachings and to ensure that they bear fruit. When you go to the Theragata, which is the verses of the elders, you find that Venerable Mahakachana uh, has eight verses. And uh, it's quite interesting to actually study these because usually they're not things that lay people in particular would look at. But when you look at them, they're actually quite effective in drawing the mind towards what uh, Venerable Mahakachana is advising. And of course, in certain instances, he's advising the monks. In other instances, he would be advising maybe the king. And uh, 
therefore there's something uh, worthwhile to look at them now these first two that we look at uh, they, they all appear in 8.1 of the Theragata but in terms of the verses it's 494 to 495 in this case but they go through to 501 and these first two verses uh, apparently were spoken to the bhikkhus because Venerable Mahagachana had noticed that a number of monks had laid aside their meditation practice in order to delight in work and in company and they were also growing very fond of delicious food that was uh, being provided by lay supporters and so in a way these verses are a form of admonishment but I guess you could also see that there's a teaching in there and a teaching that although it's directed at monks it's something that's useful for us who are trying to walk the Noble Eightfold Path who are training ourselves as trainees of the Buddha to look at how we can optimize our, our progress and so it's quite useful to actually look at uh, what Venerable Mahakachana is actually saying. So the verse verse says, uh, one should not do much work. One should avoid people and not bustle to obtain gifts. One who is eager and greedy for tastes misses the goal that brings happiness. So quite obviously here, uh, uh, Venerable Mahakachana is pointing to the fact that if you're busy doing work, if you're busy uh, with people and groups, if your motive is to receive gifts or some kind of uh, activity surrounding that intention, and if you're greedy for food, then it's quite obvious that you would miss the goal of uh, the practice itself. And that, that's the thing that actually brings long lasting happiness. Now, <clears throat> when you apply it to the Sangha in terms of the monastic Sangha it's quite obvious that uh, Venerable Mahakachana's words here are quite uh, specific and quite useful because if you're busy doing construction work, uh, dealing with guests, dealing with all kinds of requests from lay people, if you're always in groups, if you're having to entertain, uh, if you have a role within the monastery that entails you dealing with people and entertaining to a certain extent um, then that's not conducive nor is if you find yourself uh, going towards uh, the intention of wanting uh, gifts or offerings from from people and if you're also looking forward to uh, particular days of the week where you know that there is particular dana coming uh, there's been you know instances where there are set days that lay people bring food and on particular days it's a known fact that it's more lavish and so clearly if Venerable Mahakachana is actually highlighting you know not to be eager for tastes even if you're having one meal a day what's the point of having one meal a day out of greed as opposed to having three meals a day with more equanimity and so he's discouraging being eager or energetic towards uh, this greed for rasa, this, this taste through your tongue, flavors. And in that way, you end up missing the goal of the path that uh, you, you actually uh, lessen how you walk the path and reduce, uh, if not miss the goal, as Venerable Mahakachana said. Now for lay people, this is also interesting because uh, we can also be quite busy uh, with our responsibilities, not just our jobs, but our families, with our community, with our other interests and things that, that are going on. And in the same way, uh, it's not to get too busy, because as we know, when we looked at the Seika Patipada Sutta, the encouragement is that if you're too busy and you talk too much, you have too much chatter in your mind, you're surrounded by by lots of people there's no seclusion there's no seclusion from contact with the world and in that case what it normally leads to is uh, the inamitta you end up out of uh, toiling in the world you end up not being wakeful as and, and really being uh, entering into dullness and, and drowsiness just by way of being exhausted and having done so much and said so much and also when it comes to this not bustling, usually we are as lay people bustling uh, for 
some kind of objective and usually it's uh, by way of money. So for monastics, they don't touch money, but they are given gifts and offerings. And in the case of lay people, it's more along the lines of uh, obtaining money in order to get what we want, you know, to control our conditions and get what we want. And in the same way, when we're all about taste, when we're all about um, feeding our senses, then again, it's the same thing that we, we miss a trick, we go down uh, the, the wrong way and, and our view is not corrected and so we miss the goal as well. So that first verse is actually quite useful. It's quite precise and quite pointed. The second verse is really around uh, what, what it says is they know it's a defilement or impurity, whatever homage and veneration of families, a subtle dart difficult to extract, a contemptible person finds honor difficult to give up. This is equally uh, quite uh, direct because from a monastic point of view, uh, a lot of respect is given, a lot of uh, homage and veneration because of the robe. And what sometimes uh, one can't see is that it can become an impurity, a defilement when you start to Im imbue in expectation of homage and veneration from families because they're more than willing to give it. And uh, Venerable Makachana is actually quite direct in saying it's a subtle dart, difficult to extract. A contemptible person finds honor difficult to give up. Sakara is honor. And when you think about the things that Buddha and the Noble Arahants are normally warning, it's Laba Sakara Siloka. And Laba being gain, Sakara being honor, and Siloka being popularity or fame. And when you reflect on this particular verse that uh, Venu Makachana is saying, it applies equally to lay people because what happens is we get intoxicated when we're given respect and when we're uh, venerated by people. In Dhamma, it's quite easy to be uh, paid homage and, and venerated for sharing Dhamma, for being a good Kalyanamitta, for all kinds of things, even from an age perspective. But it's important to know that if one becomes intoxicated, then that becomes a defilement, an impurity. It's like you're rolling around in mud because pankoti or panka is normally uh, translated something like mud or bog, uh, but clearly it's an impurity or a defilement. And so it's good to be cautious around it. Now with monastic sangha, it's quite clear Venerable Mahakachana is saying, be careful with the homage and veneration of families because it's an impurity. One, it, It's like standing on a precipice. One has to be quite careful. And he goes on to say it's a subtle dart. It's a sala. So this is something that goes in like poison. If you think about a dart, like an arrow, when it hits you, uh, what goes in is, is the poison, which is one, the dart is difficult to extract, but so is the poison. And so he's warning that a person that is not heedful to the Buddha's words, uh, uh, to the Dhamma, then you can fall for honor. And when you like honor, you gravitate towards receiving honor, you expect it, then it becomes very difficult to give up. And so this is like a warning to say, be very cautious about this because this can veer you off the path. And the same thing applies to lay people. Because in samsara, the way lay people operate is on uh, this fame, fortune, power, wealth, uh, similar kinds of things. But honor and respect is something that is also applicable, that uh, we give it to elders, uh, we give it to people who are uh, wealthy, powerful, all kinds of things, knowledgeable, uh, who have an important position, so-called position in the world. And so the same thing applies to lay people, that if one is uh, being given homage and veneration uh, from families or groups, then it's good to recognize it as a defilement and recognize that one shouldn't become intoxicated or expect these kinds of things, because once that kind of poison goes in, uh, as Venerable Mahakachana is saying, it's difficult to extract. And so we don't want to be this kind of contemptible person or vile person 
who refuses to give up um, honour, that when you go to a place, you have this expectation in a very haughty way that I should be respected, I should be honoured, I should have the best seat, I should be asked to receive the food first, I should uh, be listened to, and all the things that surround when you think you deserve to be respected. And so it becomes a, a, a trap and it takes one off the path. And this kind of conceit actually takes you directly into wrong view because you become imbued with your own views and opinions and you lose sight of the Buddha's words, you lose sight of the noble Arahant's words and you lose sight of the goal. And you lose sight of um, the traps that are in the world, that are in samsara. And so these two verses are actually uh, very useful, uh, very short, but also very useful. And there's probably much more to be contemplated in meditation around these words. But that gives you a taste of Venerable Makachana's uh, type of teaching, type of um, wise words. So that's our short tour of the teachings of Venerable Mahakachana and a bit of a flavor for where he gave detailed explanations of Buddha's brief statements, invitations from the monks as well as invitations from lay people, and also a bit of a glimpse into some of his separate teachings where he simply gave teachings to monks and lay people. And there's probably more to actually share, but I, I'm going to leave it here. Um, there may or may not be part three because there's one or two things that I haven't shared uh, in relation to some of the stories around Venerable Mahakachana. But this uh, second part gives you a little bit of an idea about the, the method of his teaching, uh, the depth of his knowledge into the Dhamma, the praise that he was given by the Buddha and also uh, the honour that he was given by the monks for being one who could explain in, in great detail uh, verses of the Buddha. And it also gives you an idea that he was very interested in guarding the sense faculties, in knowing uh, sense consciousness, what happens with the ear, eyes, nose, tongue, body and mind when it uh, combines with consciousness and combines with objects and also around uh, intimacy in the village, seeing the dangers of getting into quarrels and disputes and the methodical way that he approached understanding where the Buddha was coming from in that respect. And it's quite timely for uh, lay practitioners to actually understand some of these things because Quite often we don't see the danger and so therefore we don't see the escape from the danger in terms of how we actually construct our lives, uh, where to establish healthy boundaries and for what reason, like the wisdom behind it. And so Venerable Markachana offers a way into some of the Buddha's teachings which are encouraging us to see that danger, to understand that there is an escape from this whole mass of suffering and, and therefore, that's what makes Venerable Mahagachana one of uh, our worthy role models. That there are so many people that we put on a pedestal, um, but Venerable Mahagachana proves time and time again uh, that he is one who is quite superior and quite noble as a great disciple of the Buddha. And we should heed what he has to say and investigate further into some of those teachings that we've been through today and some of the ones that we haven't covered. So we can share the merit with all sentient beings. May all beings be happy and well. May all beings be free from suffering. Blessings of the Triple Gem, wishing you all well. Peruan Saranai.